All right, so I've got my Lightroom here because the, the whole thing with portraits is you have to start and you have to have a system that works so it's impossible to mess up. And for me, my system starts before the people even get there. Get there early and whenever possible, if you can, try to get everything set up way before they get there. And this is the key to having good color. Now again, it's not always possible. If you're shooting outside, you don't necessarily have conditions that are going to stay consistent for the duration. But if you're working indoors, having this little color swatch thing is the key. And what you do is in Lightroom, you go to the develop module, you get the little eyedropper tool and click on the swatch, then you can sync that across all the pictures because if the gray balance is right on that thing, everything else will fall into place and it'll make the color perfect on everything. That way you don't have to deal with it one by one in Photoshop. And, and as an added benefit, it makes them all match. So getting over to Photoshop, I. You know, everybody's got a different way of doing things. And of course I've got mine. And I like to do most of the work in Photoshop because, uh, you know, frankly, I know Photoshop better than I know Lightroom. And I'm, I'm one that, you know, I'll go with what I know. So let me get to my folder here real quick. And I, I chose a photo that's got a lot of problems. So I'm not declaring this a masterpiece, so don't be giving me, you know, 60s and whatever for scores. So anyway, so I've got a photograph here and I'd like to get this back to the beginning. This, this has some issues, the exposure's wrong on it. That's another thing. Photoshop is not for fixing things, it's for finishing things. And ideally, the exposure would have been right on this, but it's kind of close. Person loves it, we'll just imagine this is the one that they really love and we're gonna stick with it. Now, I'm a big fan of using actions and I've made an action that will put these layers on that I'm going to mention automatically. If you want it, just email me and I'll be happy to send it over to you. But for this one, since we don't have time to go over every little step and learn how to use every tool, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. So first of all, we have to have a plan of action. And first of all, this, this little piece here, we need to get rid of that. We're gonna get rid of this little funky uh, folds here. The dress isn't laying quite right here. Those are some things that are obvious that we need to get rid of. And then we'll go on to the less obvious things. So the first thing I do is duplicate the background layer to get a layer that we're going to do the major retouching on. And you can see I've already gone under the filter menu to liquefy and fixed many of the problems. So as I click this on and off, I want to point out to you the issues. We kind of skinnied her up in here and that little piece that was showing over back that didn't look right, fixed the dress here. And also, and, and you have to be subtle with this, but I kind of counteracted the effects of gravity over time. It brought the jawline up just a tiny bit and I mean a tiny bit, because if you overdo it, it'll look weird. And then move the cheeks up just a little bit. So as I click on and off here, you can take a look and you can see the difference. It still looks like her. It's not like we're trying to make her look like she did 20 years ago. We're trying to make her look her very best. So that's that. Now, when it comes to wrinkles, I've got a whole strategy for that. And I'm going to explain that in a separate photograph in a moment. So I'm just going to skip on that. Now, of course, there's always some additional retouching that needs to be done that I may have neglected. So it's okay to have a blank layer and do your retouching right on the blank layer. The only thing is you just have to make sure that when you use the clone stamp tool, you choose to have it sample all the layers and not just the layer that you happen to be working on. Now, when it comes to sharpening, sharpening, woo, I have control here. Sharpening doesn't work well on portraits because it sharpens every little pore and makes every little flaw look bad. But there are a couple things that need to be sharpened up a little bit. 
and I overdid it slightly here just for clarity on the screen, but I've got a sharpen layer here, but I have a layer mask. So the only areas that are being affected are the eyes, the part in the lips, the eyebrows, and just along the hairline. It, those are the only things that have to be sharp on a portrait. And I want to hasten to say that when you're working with sharpen, it's not the make something blurry and focus tool. It's sharpen. It's just for that tiny little bit to give it some snap. If, if the eyes are not perfectly sharp, it's a bad portrait and there's nothing you can do about it. So I've sharpened just the eyes and eyebrows and the part and the lip. And then finally, if it's necessary, my little action that I made puts a curve layer in here to adjust the contrast and the tone. In this case, it doesn't need it because that's already been taken care of in Lightroom. Because in this case, this was shot indoors and we were able to use that gray card to balance everything. Now, as far as I'm concerned, if, if you wanna pick the thing that gives you the most benefit for the least amount of work, it would be burning and dodging. The trouble is that the burn and dodge tools in Photoshop are really lame. So what I recommend, and again, this is in my little action that I wrote, I make a burn and dodge layer out of adjustment layers. I'll show you how I do it real quick, just so you'll know. It's, it's so easy. Just make a curves adjustment layer, and for dodge, just pull this up a little bit. Again, it's not even scientific because I'll show you why in a minute. So that would be the dodge layer. You do the opposite to make the burn layer. I've already got my ones put in here. So dodging, as you know, is lightening up selective areas. So you can see here, lightened up the eyes, lightened up the front of the dress a little bit to make it a little more three-dimensional looking, added a little bit more rim light to her and you click it on and off here a few times so you can see the difference. It's subtle differences, but important differences. And I gotta tell you, Lee, he's the master of doing eyes and things, but since I'm not the master Lee is, I'll show you what I do. Is, like I said, sharpen the eye lashes here a little bit. And then I just, with the dodge, just give it a little swipe around the bottom of the colored part of the eye. And that way it just helps it to show better. Let me show you here real quick again. See, too dark, ah, that looks better. Now burning, like you probably know, that is selectively darkening areas. So I've got another layer for that. So for darkening, just to let you know what the strategy was, you know, the arms here, they were just as bright as the face. We always want to have our eyes go to the brightest part of the picture, which should be the face. So these areas were burned down just a little bit. I put a little bit more under the jawline to separate the jaw from the neck. That's one of my little pet peeves is that, you know, so many photographers, and, and if you disagree with me, that's fine, but so many photographers try and reflect too much light up underneath the jawline, and then the jawline kind of blends in with the neck and it, it makes the person look heavier than they are. So I don't recommend endeavoring to try and get rid of that. Instead, put a little shadow in. And then a, a few little underneath the eyes, just to make it a little bit more three-dimensional looking. Here, I'll click it on and off a couple of times so you can see the difference. We're dealing with subtle differences here, but ones that make a big difference in the overall appearance of the picture. So there we have it. If you've never taken a drawing class before, I highly recommend it. If you'll take just a simple basic drawing class, doesn't matter if you ever learn how to draw, what it'll do is it'll teach you to know how to burn and dodge because you'll learn how light and darks work together just in a basic drawing class. And there's lots of local art centers around. I know we've got a couple over here in Pinellas. Hillsboro's got a few as well. So no reason not to just take a little evening drawing class to make your photography a lot better. And then finally, my little secret concealer layer. What that does is kind of smooths the skin out. I'll show you how to do that on a separate thing in just a moment. But you can see here, that really helps a lot because uh, you know, her skin was 
you know, not quite smooth in this. This is just a, a volunteer thing that we were doing for a class. So big difference. So here's the strategy. And again, we're recording this so you don't even have to write it down. I like to do the liquefy first because that's usually the biggest issue. And if you retouch, then do liquefy, it messes up your retouching. So do the liquefy, then take the spot healing brush tool, take care of all the blemishes because you have to have clear skin to work with to get rid of wrinkles. So do the blemishes first and then do any major retouching and wrinkles, any additional retouching that you overlook. Finally, burn and dodge. The next one should say sharpen. It's a good thing it's not a typing class. And then finally, my little concealer thing. So I'll show you what that means. All right, so here's my top secret concealer thing. And so, some of you guys that are real masters, you may cringe when you see this, but I've gotten really good results with it. So I'm gonna stick with it. All right. So the whole idea is we wanna kind of use the same method that a person would with makeup. People lay down some foundation and some toner to kind of smooth the skin out. So this is exactly the same strategy. I'm going to use the brush tool. I've got a big old soft edged brush. And like Lee mentioned, you can use the bracket buttons on the keyboard to adjust the size of the brush. I'm a big fan of keyboard shortcuts. If you hold down the letter I, it turns it into the eyedropper temporarily. And you can sample that color, and then kind of paint this in. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, Chuck, this is gonna be a mess. Uh, stick with me and you'll see. So eyedroppering, oops, and painting. Make the brush a little smaller, eyedropper, and paint. I know, I know it's looking bad, but you stick with me and you'll see. Eyedropper, paint. I'm not gonna do the whole thing, so don't worry, you're not gonna get bored yet. Okay, so there's that. Of course, it's looking bad. But if this was just a tiny bit over her, it would really smooth things out. So since it's on its own layer, we can go to the opacity up at the top and reduce the opacity and just add enough. 30% or less is what I recommend. So now, just smooths it out just a little bit. Here's the real one. So we're not covering up the texture of the skin. We don't want them to look plastic. We just want them to look their very best. So that's my strategy. Now, okay, I got three minutes to show you my top secret wrinkle technique. You ready? I'll take that as a yes. All right, so we got a dude here who's got some wrinkles. Now, if you take all the wrinkles out, the person looks totally fake. Nobody likes it, except maybe the person that's paying you. But even then, everybody's gonna make fun of them because they're like, ha ha, that's you 20 years ago. So here's how you do it to make them look their best, but not make it obvious that it was retouched. Now, like I said before, you wanna use a separate layer for everything. So I'm going to make a duplicate of the background layer Duplicate layer, and I like to name my layers as I go because it's kind of tough to see what's what with these little thumbnails. And you probably are familiar with the patch tool, and I don't recommend trying to do a big old section all at once with it because it won't give you very good results. Do it a little bit at a time. The circle around the wrinkles, drag it down onto some good skin. That's why we take care of blemishes first because you need good skin to use this with. Otherwise, you're gonna end up retouching blemishes twice. All right, so I, I got all the major wrinkles out from around this dude's eyes, and I'll just do this little piece here just for fun too. All right. All right, so either this is obviously retouched or this guy's had some plastic surgery because we know he's not 20. So here's what we do. All these retouches were done on a separate layer. So what we do, go to the opacity, and the opacity is like a control for how much wrinkles. Here it is with 0%, here it is 100%, somewhere in between, it's gonna look good. So we'll just kind of run that up a little bit. 
probably like that. So there it is without, there it is with. So we're really just laying a little bit of smoothed out on top of the picture. It's a similar strategy to what we were using with that concealer layer that I was showing you a few minutes ago. So that's how you control the wrinkles. It's, it's just like a dimmer switch for wrinkles. You, you run it up until it looks normal, but don't cover them up completely. And that is exactly 15 minutes. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed showing it to you. And like Rob mentioned, if you have any questions or if you need any help, I want to help you. Just email me, chuck at chuckvosberg.com. Call me, 727-743-1740. I'm happy to help you. I really enjoy TAPA. I, I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am in life without the help of TAPA members. And I want to give the same thing back.